Hey, welcome back everyone. For the last part of our program, we have a Q&A panel with four members of the local literary community. We have Noah Falk, the author of three poetry collections, Exclusions, Snowman Losing Weight, and You Are in Nearly Every Future. He is also the education director at Just Buffalo Literary Center. Um, we have Kimberly Krug, the owner of Monkey See, Monkey Do Bookstore, an online indie bookstore specializing in curated book services and creative literacy-based programs and events. She also founded the annual Kids Book Expo that Barb mentioned earlier. Um, welcome to Alyssa Palumbo, the author of four historical fiction novels, The Violinist of Venice, The Most Beautiful Woman in Florence, The Spellbook of Katrina Van Tassel, and The Borgia Confessions. And our final panelist is Lou Rera, the author of three horror, supernatural, and crime books. There are No Doors on a Cocoon, Sign, and Awake, Tales of Terror. So we have opened the chat and you can ask questions for our panelists at any time. Um, but to get started, I'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves so you can get an idea of their areas of expertise. Noah, could you start us off by introducing yourself? Absolutely. Um, thanks for first of all having me in this space, and you know it's really cool to be able to to sit here virtually with you all and to learn. Like I caught a lot of uh, what Marty's presentation was really quite informative, almost overwhelmingly informative. Um, so yeah, my name is Noah Falk, Education Director at Just Buffalo Literary Center, nonprofit arts organization, just a block away from the downtown library. Um, and I've been writing poems for, for many, many years, been, um, and, and as, as Lee mentioned, uh, have a few books of poems out. So uh, really happy to be here. Um, our first question for you is um, that your newest book, Exclusions, came out this August, uh, which was a really challenging time for new books. But despite the pandemic, you found some really innovative ways to promote its re release in the Buffalo community. Could you tell us a little about that? Yeah, absolutely. And Marty sort of alluded to that as well, just um, the pandemic sort of rattling the existence of publishing in so many ways. And uh, my publisher who published Tupelo, I'm sorry, who published Exclusions was Tupelo Press. Um, and the initial release date was actually for June. And they, at that time, they were sort of thinking, this will blow over, we'll just push it to August. August came around and we're still sort of in the situation, um, but they had to release it because they had books on their publishing uh, calendar that, that had to come out at, at the same point too. So it was just sort of pushing things down the line. Um, and instead of having um, an actual release party, which many people do during uh, to celebrate a books coming into the world, um, one of the ideas I had was just sort of to have sidewalk, socially distant um, porch readings for anybody who wanted me to come by. So I would, you know, most of these readings were happening in the neighbor or, you know, around Buffalo, downtown, Allentown neighborhoods, Elmwood Village, uh, where people would just sort of have me over uh, sort of after work and I would come and read, you know, four or five poems from the book to them. They would ask a few questions. And I think that, the thinking around that was just reading to me specifically has always been like an intimate act. And I think presenting work can also be very intimate. And I think it's important to sort of give space um, and time for people to sort of connect to the work. So I was hoping that was a way to like, hey, let me read you a few poems. Um, and it, it was still, it's still looking back on it, I was, I loved a lot of it. I learned a lot about myself and, and sort of reading to, to strangers. Um, but during the pandemic, the mind, it was, it was almost like a relief state for some people. Cause it like, like, again, what Marty was saying, they're either thinking about politics or the pandemic, there's really little space for anything else um, outside of like survival. So um, that, that was the gist of what I did. I also did a number of online sort of virtual readings, but there's been such an oversaturation of these spaces and like how do you present in this space it's actually going to be meaningful um not to say that it can't happen but it's just really the attention span of staring into a screen for five hours during a day is enough to to hurt all of us so um 
but yeah, with all that said, I'm really happy the book's in the world. I don't know, you know, the readership, it's hard to gauge. Um, but, um, you know, I feel fortunate that I'm still able to write poems and, and, and be participating in, in that conversation. That's great. And that's such a cool way to promote it and connect with readers during this weird time. Um, so everyone, you are welcome to type in some questions for Noah in the chat. Um, and while you do that, I'll ask him to introduce herself. Thank you, Leah. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, my name is Kim Krug. I'm the owner of Monkey See, Monkey Do Children's Bookstore. We're an independent bookstore in uh, Western New York. Uh, we had a brick and mortar store for just over 11 years. And this past September, um, we, I, I did, made the decision to um, shed the brick and mortar and we're now a bookstore on the go, on the move. So we book sell all over the world, all over the country. Um, I do curated book bundles. I do book sub subscriptions. I work with the schools. Um, in some extent, it's been incredibly liberating because I've been able to do um, some more programming that is not just exclusive to one area of our Western New York market. It's allowed me to kind of branch out and break out of those walls. So um, it's been good. Um, I consider myself on the move these days. Um, so as an indie bookstore owner, what are the do's and don'ts for independent authors to get their books into a bookstore? You know, I was thinking about this question that you posed, Leah, and I would say um, there's probably four things that I would recommend. One is um, be mindful of the booksellers time. Um, so make an appointment, you know, whether it's reaching out by email or by phone. Um, I really um, discourage um, or discouraged when authors would just walk into the bookstore and present their material. It just wasn't always the right tone and it's not being mindful of their time or space. So I always encourage um, to make an appointment to connect online, pick up the phone, um, make sure that the material is in its, its, in its best form, right? So like, you know, um, don't bring in pieces of paper and say, I have this great idea. I, I want to show it to you. I, wa I want to get this into your bookstore. Um, make sure it's in its final format stage um, so that it, it's presentable. Um, be mindful of the price of the book um, and, you know, certainly um, do the research and your homework in terms of your pricing point. Um, you know, in terms of the marketplace, typically um, a hardcover book for a children's book is somewhere between $16.99 and, you know, $18.99. Certainly for adult books that gets up a little bit higher to, you know, your high 20s. Um, and then paperback books can range anywhere from $3.99 to sometimes, you know, $9.99. But, um, you know, be mindful of the price of your book because, you know, if you come into the bookstore um, or into, yeah, try to sell your book and your price point is way above that mark, um, it's going to be a hurdle regardless, you know, so that's, that's one um, other point I'd like to make is the, pri the price. Um, the last two points would be marketing plan and expectations and have good expectations. So regarding a marketing plan, what I mean by that is, you know, think about, think thoughtfully about your book and the position of your book and how you might see this as being, um, you know, uh, impactful in our community and what type of event or um, marketing angle could this book play? Um, and I always love to help, you know, kind of creating some type of special event or program around a book, but it's important for the author of that book or illustrator to have some thoughts in that, in that as well. And then just be very um, realistic of expectations. I think, um, you know, when I take on a book, um, I become that book's, I, I become a salesperson for that book too. You know, I want to promote it. I want to advocate for it. I want it to sell well in our community. Um, but, you know, 
expectations are important in terms of how how many books we can possibly sell. We have a lot of um, obviously um, books that we're we're being mindful of at the same time. That's some really great advice. Um, audience, you're welcome to add some questions for Kim. Um, and in the meantime, I'll ask Alyssa to tell a, to tell us about a bit about yourself. Everyone. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, my name is Alyssa Palumbo, as author of four historical novels, um, all from St. Martin's Griffin, which is an imprint of Macmillan Publishers. Uh, uh, the, the Violinist of Venice, The Most Beautiful Way. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's me. Um, you actually kind of froze up a little. Would you mind repeating oh, no. that? Sure, yeah. I just was um, sharing the titles of my books, The Violinist of Venice, The Most Beautiful Woman in Florence, The Spellbook of Katrina Van Tassel, and okay, The Borgia Confessions, which um, just came out this past February. Our first question for you is about social media. You do a great job promoting your work and connecting with readers on Instagram and Twitter. Do you have any tips for building your audience on these platforms, especially if you are new to social media? Yeah. So I, think, I think if you're new to social media and you're interested in writing, and, and having a writing career. I think it's a hashtag is a big one. Um, and, you know, folks sometimes share things about what they're working on. So we start to follow those hashtags and start to sort of look at, um, you know, what folks are saying, you know, join the conversations, reply, reply to other authors. You know, when I first started on social media, I followed a bunch of authors whose work I liked. You know, I would reply to their questions and comment on things they were saying, and soon, you know, you're having a conversation. So I think the thing with social media is to just jump in and, you know, talk to people and, and see where it goes. And, you know, sometimes you can meet critique partners, you can meet fellow authors to become friends, you know, all of that has happened to me. Um, and I would also share um, some really good advice, I think, that my agent gave me about social media when I was first starting to write as a career. She told me to follow the rule of thirds. So of what you post on social media, a third of that should be promoting your own work or about your own work or your own process. Um, the second third should be promoting other authors' work because that's just a, you know, sort of good karma. Um, but B, you know, as writers, we should also be readers. And so talk about what you're reading and what you're loving. Um, and then the last third, she said, is cats. And she said, by cats, what she means is not necessarily cats, but whatever you're into, like readers, um, other writers, you know, folks you might meet on social media, they like to get a little bit of a sense of who you are outside of your work, too. Um, and obviously, that can be, you know, however much you're comfortable sharing. Obviously, no need, no need to share personal life details if, if you're not comfortable doing so. Um, but, you know, what, what movies are you watching? What are you binging on Netflix? Um, you know, what are you doing to, to stay sane in these COVID times? You know, things like that. That's really great advice. I definitely want to see pictures of authors' cats, more cats <laughs> on social media, please. Yes. Um, all right, and you can post your questions for Alyssa in the chat. Um, and while you do that, Lou, could you introduce yourself? Hi, I can't seem to get my video to work here. Um, so is that something? Yeah, start my video. I see it. OK, great. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Lou Vera. Um, I'm a former professor of communication at Buffalo State. I've since retired, which is a great thing because I can dedicate all my time to write. Um, I write horror, but I really write in the subgenre of crime and supernatural crime. And um, one of the best things I ever did uh, during my time after I got published was to join the Horror Writers Association, which is an international organization dedicated to the genre of horror. And um, through that organization and the connections I've made, and especially joining the New York City chapter, and the connections and the networking that that allows me has really opened up a lot of doors for me in terms of how to promote what I write instead of sort of floundering out there without any direction 
in, in this particular genre. So uh, if I could say for anyone in any genre, whatever you write, if there is a group like that, that supports your, um, the type of work you do, search them out and join them if you haven't done so already. I, I find that to be incredibly invaluable. Um, I just put out a new book in May um, with uh, an association in New York City with uh, the same group, Box Nine Books, and they, uh, it's, it's called Awake Tales of Terror. And it's a collection of 13 um, short stories. Um, I did one story in that collection, which was sort of a challenge for another anthology uh, in which I took an Edgar Allan Poe story, which is public domain, rewrote it. Um, it was the uh, Facts in the Case of Dr. M, I'm sorry, Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar. So it was kind of an interesting challenge to reimagine a Poe story and, and somewhat intimidating at the same time. So um, you write crime books, and those are really hot right now. I think they might serve as kind of a comfort food, as other people were talking about earlier. There's something fun, a type of escapism. How did you decide to write in that genre? Uh, unfortunately for the people around me, um, they can never understand why I can't look at any of the brighter side of things. I always like to look at, at the dark side of, of, of life. Uh, glass half empty, glass half full. Um, it doesn't mean I'm morose, it's just that I like to explore the darker side of how we think and everyone has that. We've all had nightmares, so we don't know where those come from, but I'd, I like to explore that side of things. All right, thank you. Um, people start taking questions from um, the audience. If you have any, the chat is now open and you're welcome to submit your questions. Um, our first one is a question for Kim. When you had a bookstore, if an author walked in with a self-published indie book, would you sell it or were you just selling books published on a national scale? Okay, sorry. I was just unmuting myself. Absolutely. Um, I sold indie um, local authors, promoted local authors as well as national authors. So I'm a big advocate and uh, of our community and a supporter of Western New York um, and local authors. Um, matter of fact, um, the Children's Book Week and the Western New York Children's Book Expo, uh, which was founded uh, five years ago um, by my mother and I, um, recognize not only national, international author and illustrator challenge, but we looked um, right within our own community and focused on recognizing uh, the talent right within Buffalo. So every year um, we had a percentage of authors that we um, would bring to and call attention to to feature their book and um, make sure that uh, we were recognizing the greatness right within our own community. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question for Noah. What are some of the classes offered by Just Buffalo Literary Center for beginning authors? Great question. Um, well, we, we sort of have a rolling workshop offering for local writers or writers from anywhere at this point. Um, it's on our website, justbuffalo.org. Um, and they range, you know, they rain, they change seasonally. So uh, some are like for beginning novelists, some are for beginning poets, or at any stage in your life, really, or at your writing career. Um, so I would just sort of direct you to justbuffalo.org, and it has a plethora of information about um, all the workshops that are offered for really any ages, any age, and um, any stage in your career. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question for Alyssa. What are the key considerations in writing historical fiction? Um, but yeah, so for historical fiction, um, obviously there's a, there's a lot of research involved. So you have to, you have to know that going in, you have to be ready to do that. Um, that's, you know, obviously a very time consuming part of the process. Um, so it has to be 
it has to be something you're very interested in because you're you're going to have to do a lot of research. You're going to have to do a lot of digging into it. So if it's something that you have only a, sort of a passing interest in, it might not be the best topic uh, to carry you through for a whole novel because not only do you have the the work of you know, writing, revising the whole novel, et cetera, um, but also the research. So make sure that it's something you're really deeply interested in and that you're very curious about um, and, you know, can commit to really, really doing the work to dig into it. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Lou. When you were teaching at Buff State, did any of the students go on to become writers or famous writers? Actually, uh Yes, um, one of my students ended up being a showrunner for NCIS out in Los Angeles. And at Buffalo State, we taught screenwriting and, and film production. So um, a number of students moved out to LA. Some worked in the production end, but uh, a few of them end up as screenwriters and have successfully done their own work and worked for Paramount and other studios out there. Uh, there is some some of the students that ended up in New York City in the same capacity. That's great. Um, we have a question for Noah. Um, in your experience, do publishers prefer cost sharing arrangements with an author with an upfront payments, or is this something to stay away from? You said cost pay, cost paying what? Say that again. Cost, um, cost sharing arrangements. I, you know, I really don't know anything about that. Um, <laughs> so I typically, you know, in the poetry world, it's more of um, send your manuscripts and your poems into a publisher and then they will sort of make all the arrangements on the back end. So I don't know if there's a, if that's a situation with another genre. Yeah, that might um, be a good, I'm not sure who asked this question, but that might be a good um, thing to ask Marty if you're able to get in touch with her. Um, let's see if you have any more questions. Um, Kim, you mentioned that your bookstore travels all over the country. How do you decide where to go? Well, I'm going actually now from the comfort of my home, so it's <laughs> it's quite lovely. Um, I'm going virtually. Um, the uh, the silver lining for the bookstore, quite honestly, has been that it's given me pause to pivot the business in a way that I think is a sustainable model moving forward. Um, how I'm traveling all over the country is in partnership with other indie bookstores all over the country. So um, I actually began a grassroots effort called Indies Unite, um, where I'm collaborating in really fun, creative ways with indie bookstores all over the country. We're working together to use the virtual platform to highlight authors and illustrators and books and stories. Um, so that we're, we're collaborating and working together, but we're bringing it to our own independent communities, which is so lovely. So, um, you know, I expect to be doing more work with the indie community um, throughout the country and bringing more creative um, opportunities in the virtual setting. What that will look like, will, it will look like authors um, events, um, book talks, story readings, book club discussions where we bring in an author and we bring in communities together to talk about issues. So it's going to be Western New York talking with California and talking with people in Florida and discussing different issues. Um, so to me, there's this explosion of creativity right now and collaboration and opportunities to be um, a bookseller in a very creative space. Thank you. Um, and we have a question for Alyssa. Since you're writing historical fiction, how much research do you do and where do you do your research? So it depends on the book. Book. The process always looks a little bit different for each book. How I generally go about it is I sort of do enough research up front to get me started. And then I usually write a first draft and then I'll go back and do another big chunk of research to kind of fill in any holes um, and, and flesh out what's in the manuscript. And I find that if I write the first draft, that shows me where to focus my research. Um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. And I, I think it's, it's really tough to tell how much is needed or, or when to stop. I think a good rule of thumb sometimes that I use for myself is when I sort of know that I'm done doing research is when I start running into the same information in multiple different sources, things that I've already read. Um, you know, not to say that obviously that means that I know everything. I certainly don't. Um, but, you know, if I'm, I'm looking for certain things to complete the book and I'm, I'm running into the same information, it, it, I have a, that shows me that I have a good sense of, of where I'm at. Um, I obviously read, read a lot of books. <laughs> That's a big part of the research. You know, online, there's, there's scholarly articles and lots of sources available online these days, certainly. Um, you know, and there's always things that you can find, like with a quick Google search while you're writing, too. I know for one of my books, at one point, I had to look up you know, what day Easter fell on in you know, a certain year in the 1700s. So that's something you can quickly Google. And, and find the answer to that. Um, in certainly in non-COVID times, um, I like to travel to the places I'm writing about, if at all possible. I don't think that's necessary. Um, you know, not all authors do that. It's certainly not a requirement. But if you can, I do recommend it. Um, you know, because sometimes you, if you can visit locations where parts of the book is set, or you know, depending what time period you're writing about, maybe there's museums that have relevant information, relevant artifacts. Um, that's all really good to, to look at as well. And then finally, what I would also add is that if you can, if there's music available from the time period that you're writing about, that's always nice to help you kind of set the scene. Um, in my case, one of my books is about music, so that was a big part of my research. And then also, you know, photographs, maps, artwork, any of those visual sources that are available for your time period. Um, so far, I haven't written in a time period for any of my published books anyway, where I have photographs available. Um, but portraiture, especially from like the Renaissance, which is a period I write about, is really helpful uh, because, you know, you can get a sense, not even really of what people looked like, because that's almost secondary, but how they dressed, how they wanted to be presented, what kind of setting are they painted in. Um, even a lot of times in the Renaissance specifically, sorry, I'm on a little bit of a tangent now, but, um, you know, it was customary to set religious scenes in local settings. So you'll see like, for instance, um, Botticelli has an adoration of the Magi that's set in the Tuscan countryside. So it gives you a little bit of a sense of what the world might have looked like at the time. Great, thank you. Um, and we have a question for Kim. Do you work with schools and how can a picture book and leveled reader author get their books into schools? Yeah, absolutely work with schools, love to partner with schools, helping them right now with, um, well, with book orders that they might need for their classrooms in their library, also working with them on virtual book fairs, which is the big thing right now. Um, and how to get books into the, that's a little bit tougher because, um, I mean, obviously it helps when you have an indie bookstore or uh, backing your book and supporting your book and bringing it to light for a school. Um, but usually it does have to go through the layer of the school in terms of the librarian or, um, you know, maybe perhaps mostly it's the librarian that will need to probably uh, review the book and make sure that it's uh, in alignment with w what they want to bring into the school. So um, it's, it's helpful when you have um, an in independent bookstore backing it and saying, you know, we really recommend this author, this book. We think it would be a great fit. Um, so I think, you know, it starts with perhaps the indie and then, um, you know, they can help you make that inroad into the school. Um, the author can certainly go to the school directly, but I think it might be a little bit harder path. Thank you. Um, Lou, what is the secret to getting media attention for your books? That's a very tricky question. Um, I, did a, I did an experiment with Facebook slash Instagram because Facebook owns Instagram. And uh, some of the research I found was 47%, there was a 47% increase in, vis in visibility or user visibility if your advertisement has motion in it. So what I decided to do was run a test and I did a series of, of uh, animated ads that uh, were like a 20 second to 30 second commercial. And it fit all the formats of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, 
because they all have different aspect ratios for, for how things are shown. And um, to get to the point, um, I found out that a very interesting thing happened to all the people, that 47% increase of viewership, after the first five seconds, it dropped off 80%. So I had to realize that, okay, I need to do a five second ad instead of a 30 second ad or a 20 second ad because of how the viewership worked out. So, and I also narrowed it down to the demographic group that I was trying to reach and then they gave me a breakdown into the age demographics and the male female demographics of who actually was engaged in those ads. So through that experiment, I was able to target a little bit better how I could reach an audience. And through that mechanism to get to the point, I was able to get uh, eight reviewers in my genre from Instagram to review my book. And one of the one of those reviewers had a following of 19,000 people. So there's lots of ways, but that was an experiment I did. That's fascinating. Um, Noah, as an educator do you, who works with students and builds trust and community, do you have any tips for how authors can build community with other authors and collaborate? Yeah, I think, um what jumped to the front of my mind is sort of following what Lou is saying is just in Alyssa, the sort of sharing of the work of other authors you admire, um, whether it's via Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, whatever platform you're comfortable with. I think that that way championing someone else's work often opens up conversations about your own work and who inspires you and why you sort of lean a certain way aesthetically um, so I think that would be the best thing is just sort of promote literature, promote the work of other authors and let, and let that sort of naturally happen as relationships in those worlds do. Great advice. Thank you. Um, we have one final question, which is for everyone. Um, people say no one reads anymore. <laughs> say it isn't so. <laughs> um, you, anyone's welcome to jump in with their thoughts on this. Uh, I'll go first. Uh, I think a lot of people still read a lot, and that also includes, you know, print books, ebooks. But I should mention though that the increase of audio books has gone up by 16 percent since 2019. So I would I would include that into the reading part, where people are still engaged in literature, and that the vehicles that they can use to access that stuff are multifaceted. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And just to, yeah, audiobooks have been huge. Um, and it's, you know, I can speak to that in the sense too that my first two books were not published on audiobook. My second two were. And then one of the, my very second book that was published, I had an offer from an audio publisher come in this year and it came out. So that's really an area where publishing is growing, where books are growing, where there's a lot of opportunity for authors, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, to, to echo Lou as well, I, I don't think that's true. I think a lot of people are reading, um, especially during you know the, these COVID times um, where more folks are at home than they tend to be. Um, I think we are seeing seeing people connect with books more often, whether that's, you know, whether they're picking up new authors or whether they're rereading old favorites. That's something I found myself doing a lot in the last few months, kind of a comfort read sort of thing, which can make it hard for authors currently working and promoting work. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, I know a few years ago with the advent of eBooks, there was kind of this death of the book sort of panic. And I just, I just don't think that that is really going to happen. I think that physical books will always be here. Um, they'll always have a place and there will always be readers. Yeah, and I would just say, um, well, just from in terms of the statistics, um, book sales are up, print book sales are up. Um, so I don't believe people um, are turning away from the book. I think that people are reading more. I think that Bookstores in general are an anchor in our community to provide hope, inspiration, distraction, 
and people are turning to books and reading, what of course I would hope um, is that they, um, where they're getting their books. Um, are they getting them online from, you know, big box stores or are they supporting their community indie bookstores? And, you know, whether it's a, a bookstore like ourselves that have um, really now turned um, to an online and a, a store that can, uh, we, we do personal deliveries too throughout Western New York. So I would say support your indie community, support your indie bookstores. Um, they are the the fabric and the voice and the vibe within your community and uh, you know keep reading great and I'll just add, I thank you guys all for that um, and I'll just add that you know reading um, changes as the times change how you sort of dive into a book or if you're on a screen or just learning to read as a kid and I think what's exciting most about books is the sort of diversity and the sort of anything you're interested in, anything. You can sort of find a community of thinking around that. And that's amazing, like to think that this sort of, this industry, this sort of technology of reading is around us. And I think the big thing is, you know, like what Kim was saying, promoting the local, talking about your own community, how can you feed that and fuel that in ways that sustain us as people and just the world. So it's really, you know, we need, I think the reading will be around forever. Books will be around forever. I'm excited that, to be able to be in this conversation with you all too. So thanks. Yeah, likewise. Thank you, everyone. Um, I just want to share a comment that someone wrote um, that all of today's speakers have been really, really helpful and they can't wait to start networking with others. Um, thank you everyone who has joined us for Indie Author today. Um, special thanks goes to our presenters, Avril Marie, E. Dolores Johnson, Barbara Sanchez, and Marty Gorman for their inspiring presentations. And to our panelists, Noah Falk, Kim Krug, Alyssa Palumbo, and Lou Rera for their wise words of advice. I hope everyone enjoyed the program and gained some useful ideas. Um, we just have a few bits of housekeeping to wrap up. You can find additional free webinars and resources on the National Indie Author Day website, www.indieauthorday.com. The recording of this event will be available on the library's website, www.buffalolib.org next week. Um, and don't forget there are 37 Buffalo and Erie County Public Libraries, as well as our website that can offer you hundreds, if not thousands, of print and online resources for up and coming and published authors. And for the first time, we are creating a Buffalo Indie Author directory to distribute for attendees. We hope this directory will help you network and build relationships with other local writers. And if you haven't submitted a bio for the directory yet, you can email it to me by Monday morning to mosierl at buffalolib.org. Um, this is open to everyone who attended Indie Author Day. You don't need to be a published author. We just hope to connect writers of all experience levels. The submission form can be found on the Indie Author Day registration page and in probably any of the emails I sent you. I'd also be happy to email it to you if you just shoot me an email and ask for it. Um, and then I'll be putting together the directory next week um, and we'll hopefully have it out to you by the end of next week. You will also be receiving a follow-up email with a survey about this event. Um, this is a completely new format to us and I hope you'll share your thoughts so that we can keep making this event better in the future. Thank you again for joining us. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend and happy writing.